Well, good afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, on behalf of, of uh, Karen and Mary Lou, we're uh, glad that you, you could join us. Um, you, uh, you all obviously are, we share a common interest in, in Western Aspen, so it's, this should be uh, hopefully enjoyable. Um, this is a, uh, a pretty remarkable, pretty remarkable species. The, uh, you, you've all seen versions of this uh, of this range map. The Aspen has a, a huge geographic range, I and mean, it's from from uh, coast to coast, uh, from essentially the Arctic Circle to to Mexico. And uh, when you combine the range of Trinulites with very closely related Aspen species in in Europe and Asia, it's it's a, a global global distribution. Um, one of the we're we're going to be focusing on on western aspen, so the the red polygon here is is sort of our our area of of concern today or focus today. Um, one of the things that I'll point out, and and Karen may refer to this later, but uh, the blue um, boundary on this uh, polygon on this map is is the extent of of continental ice during the last ice age. And so the vast majority of the range of, of Western Aspen in North America is coincident with uh, land that was not available um, until uh, not too many thousands of years ago. That's unlike Western Aspen in the, in the Rocky Mountains and the Sierras. Um, within, within our area, I mean, beyond uh, just the, the broad geographic range of Aspen. I mean, a, a truly remarkable thing about our Aspen is, uh, is its ecological amplitude. In, in the central Rockies, uh, Aspen is associated with, with every major vegetation type between lower and upper tree line. You see there in the lower left the, uh, a small Aspen stand out in the, out in the, the uh, shrub steppe. That's uh, Artemisia. Uh, and it, it's it, it's associated uh, up near upper tree line with uh, Inglewood spruce and, and subalpine fir as well. Uh, my uh, task here in the first part of this this webinar is to is to review with you um, some of the things that we were uh, until very few years ago we were absolutely convinced that we knew. Um, pretty unequivocally about uh, about Aspen, and uh, that includes the the things you see here on the list: um, its relative tolerance, its its regeneration ecology, the genetic diversity or lack of it, uh, and its role in stand dynamic succession. And then, uh, following from all of that, I mean, silviculturists, we we were pretty sure that that um, we we knew exactly how to deal with it, and it was one of the easier species to uh, to deal with and in fact that's that's still true but the story is much more uh, th there's a richer there's a richer civil cultural story that that we're becoming aware of well first of all now, now I'm dealing with with conventional wisdom or at least the conventional wisdom until a few years ago and I'm going to take I'm going to take some liberty I mean I'm I'm oversimplifying a little bit for the sake of the narrative but um, our, our view of, of the relative tolerance of, of Aspen um, is that it, it's exceedingly intolerant, um, not being able to make it in, in the understory. In contrast, for example, it, with its common associate, subalpine fir Baker, uh, in his classic textbook, um, Principles of Silviculture in 1950, in fact, characterized it as very intolerant. There wasn't anything in his experience that any tree species uh, in the in the United States that was more uh, intolerant than than aspen. Uh, we also were pretty much convinced that that uh, aspen was a a, a creature of, of dependent on on high severity disturbance. Um, there's a, a clear felling on the left there, a uh, pretty traditional way to deal with, with aspen and to regenerate it. The image on the right is, uh, is intended to be a, an exception that kind of uh, speaks to the rule. This is a, a fire-scarred aspen. It survived a surface fire. 
Um, and it certainly, when I came across this in the book cliffs here in Utah, it got my attention and I, it took me a while to convince myself that indeed uh, it was fire scarred. Um, the aspen regenerates uh, very effectively vegetatively from, from root suckers. There's all shoots arising from uh, dormant, dormant buds on, on rhizome-like uh, lateral roots. Um, and we, uh, over uh, decades, we had convinced ourselves that, in fact, in, in the West, uh, it, it's all about suckers and that uh, seedlings, uh, seeding events, if they occurred at all in nature, were exceedingly rare and, in fact, ecologically and silviculturally irrelevant. Um, some of us went so far as to state that uh, in, in print. Uh, this, this is from that, that quote uh, of myself is from the uh, regional silviculture text uh, in 1995. Um, we're uh, almost certainly um, our, our failure to recognize um, seed, seedlings uh, in nature uh, was to some extent, I'm sure, a self-fulfilling prophecy. We had, we, the, the assumption was that it was they were very, very rare, exceedingly rare. And so the, the standard of proof, the standard of proof that was associated with saying that a, that a, a, a small aspen was in fact a seedling and not a sucker uh, became prohibitively high. The bar was set so high that I'm sure that we were, we were ignoring um, aspen seedlings that were, that were right in front of us just because we assumed that it, they, uh, <clears throat> they couldn't be seedlings. Uh, because of the nature of the regeneration uh, and uh, the dependence on high severity disturbance, uh, another element of the, the conventional wisdom is that, that uh, aspen is almost entirely uh, associated with very simple stand structures. So pure, nearly pure aspen stands with a, uh, a single cohort. So even aged, even aged stands. So that's the, that's the common, that's the common model. Uh, another another thing, I've, I've uh, lectured a lot of students and, and uh, relatives and so on uh, about the, the clonality in Aspen. And, and not to put too fine a point on it, the story would go that, um, you know, Aspen clones were easily identified from a distance, I mean like from a watershed away, uh, based on, on phenology and, and gross morphology and that sort of thing. And that looking at a, at a landscape like this, you could... Uh, you know, stands were easily identified, and in fact, stands equal clones, and clones equal stands uh, for, for uh, almost entirely. So, looking, you know, looking until a few years ago, uh, I would have looked at a, a scene like this and said, "Okay, I can identify, you know, four four different clones," uh, and make make life pretty simple. The silviculture, <clears throat> excuse me, the silviculture systems that folks would think about because of all this, uh, our, our understanding of aspen, uh, in, in silviculture speak, we're talking simple coppice, so clear felling an area uh, and uh, relying on abundant natural regeneration from, from suckers uh, and that the stands arising from that, basically single species, single cohort, and from wild with high forest, with, with species that um, that arise from sexual reproduction from seedlings, uh, silviculturists are concerned about genetic diversity and what and what a, a, a particular harvest system or silvicultural system might might do to genetic genetic diversity. With aspen, we didn't we just didn't worry about that. Genetic diversity was moot. And we're gonna <clears throat> we're gonna turn. Uh, that, so that's the conventional wisdom, uh, and it turns out that probably like a lot of things in life, conventional wisdom isn't always uh, wisdom in retrospect. So we're going to turn this over to uh, Mary Lou. Hi, everybody. Well, it's not surprising with the um, 
the long-term drought that we've had throughout the West and the uh, millions of acres of wildfire that we were uh, bound to see some aspen seedlings established. The trick probably though was recognizing recognizing them on the ground floor. Um, as you see in this picture, they can look like a ground cover. We see the uh, mature aspen over on that uh, bottom left hand, uh, one that fell out of a mature aspen tree, uh, versus the lanceolate leaves that you see here on the seedlings. Um, the reason why I was able to identify them as a plant pathologist is because I recognized the foliar disease on um, the small seedlings, you can see the blackened areas from Shepherd's Crook. Of course, um, aspen seedlings were identified from the Tetons and the Yellowstone fires back in the 80s from uh, Kay as well as Rami and others. And um, they recognized both seedlings, small seedlings on the ground as well as um, Aspen in new areas several years after the fire where Aspen had not been reported before. In Arizona where um, I reside, well, there are several fires from which I and other colleagues have found Aspen seedlings following fire, either because they established in new areas or um, the seedlings were found and growing right along suckers as well. Um, one of the three major components that you need, of course, is the bare mineral soil conditions created by fire. Um, in areas where there's runoff, there, as any other plant, they're not going to get established too well. But um, in areas where there's some flatter ground or some mulch or um, protection provided, that's where we're going to find these seedlings. The second thing you need, of course, is seed production. And we find it to be quite abundant, um, especially the year after fire. One comment that I wanted to make is, um, so uh, pollen is flying through the air from Aspen in, in May, and, and uh, seed, seeds mature in early June, uh, where I come from. But our fires occur from May through early July. And so you're not going to really get seedlings established the year of the fire because they would be getting burned up or conditions just wouldn't be suitable if it's going to be fire. But it's the year after fire that you start to get those conditions because you have the bare mineral soil, you have a lot of seed produced. The other, um, and so here this picture just shows that we had some bare mineral soil. We got uh, seedlings were able to get their roots in the ground. You can even see cotyledon leaves on the one in the center lower left, um, little tiny uh, leaves. And then you see the mulch has been laid on the ground, which is going to help uh, provide some uh, moisture retention. OK, um, the other thing I wanted to discuss was the moisture availability. And uh, this just shows the climate in Flagstaff from 1950 through 2007. Notice that there's four seasons represented here. And there's different scales for the amount of precipitation that we get um, on average and how it varies, has varied over time. Uh, what I want you to notice is the summer, because of our monsoons, there's relatively consistent moisture provided from our monsoon season. And um, even in the case of a severe drought that started in 1996, you'll notice for the winter and spring that we had persistently below average precipitation, but yet um, summer was nearly average during that same time period, which is going to come into play for um, whether or not aspen seedlings can get established even during drought, severe drought conditions. OK, so is this a seedling or a sprout? Well, of course, the only way to test on some little plant like this is the root system. And for suckers, uh, what you see is there's almost like an albino type of, um, of stem um, below the ground. There's no change really in the diameter of that stem as it goes down to that where it connected with the um, lateral root, which you can see on that right-hand side photo versus seedlings, which are going to have a tapering root. They're going to have uh, fine roots starting to develop on the sides. Um, you can see that first year there's not much. And then the second year on the right, you even get some uh, lateral root development. 
on a project Karen Mock and I worked on. Um, this is a seven-year seedling. Uh, she uh, had me dig two of them out of the ground to make sure that they indeed did have tap roots. You can see there's a very strong lateral root uh, that I dug up out of the ground that was already present. And here is that tree before it was dug out of the ground. The root system was uh, it, pretty much directly underneath that log on the ground. These were found in a Ponderosa pine plantation following fire. There had been no report whatsoever ever, um, or uh, of aspen existing in this stand before the fire. There is some uh, um, aspen up above on that hillside in the background. So uh, there were 18 ponderosa pine plantations. They all had to be put in exclosures because of the great browse pressure in this area. So there were four areas, 18 plantations total. And uh, what I wanted you to notice here was that upper right um, group of plantations had the most aspen seedlings. Each one of those green uh, uh, dots represent um, aspen stems that were sampled um, genetically to show that there were differences, um, genetic differences, and that they were seedlings. Here's a picture uh, just showing the, the variation in bud break. These pictures were all taken the same day within the same fenced area and just shows uh, differences in uh, those seedlings on when they were breaking bud. If there were suckers from a seedling, the bud break was identical. So we had, uh, these are the four areas at the top of the plantations. And then the number in parentheses is how many of those plantations had seedlings. And then the total number of seedlings that we found. And then notice at the bottom the number of aspirin sprouts. So that by uh, 11 years after fire, uh, there was a total of 316 stems, yet just uh, 70 genets, or original seedlings. And then the star was to remind me to tell you that those two aspen uh, seedlings that I dug out of the ground to prove that they're, they did have the tap root and they were seedlings, apparently I had left uh, some of the lateral root in the ground because both of them had produced suckers uh, that were genetically identical. And um, because this was an open area and this, these seedlings were spread out, the GPS would uh, take you right back to the same location um, to seedlings. Okay, we also aged our seedlings by counting the uh, terminal bud scale scars, uh, similar to the work of um, Kay and the Grand Tetons and Rami et al. in, uh, in the Yellowstone fire areas. And uh, our results were similar to theirs in that 90% of the seedlings got established within the first three years following fire. And um, we had um, uh, seedlings established as far as six years out. For the Yellowstone fires, it was um, eight years. Um, the majority of our seedlings, 60%, established within that first year. Um, in 2002, we had our more, most severe drought year, um, so we didn't expect to, to see much there. Um, Kay had found that uh, the 60 percent of his seedlings established that second year, and uh, he noted that that was due to moisture availability, that, that that second year was the better year. OK, so in this uh, photo of the Ponderosa Pine Plantation, uh, what I can see is six different seedlings, aspen seedlings. And it just um, indicates that in a, a frequent fire environment, such as these Ponderosa Pine areas, there's a uh, potential for uh, genetic diversity um, among the aspen if they get established since bare mineral soil conditions are being provided more frequently. 
We did find just two Aspen seedlings outside of the fences. Um, other four servers workers had, had noted more were present originally. They piled uh, logs that were on the ground around this one, and it does show signs of, of browse impacts, as does the other, but, but the logs keep getting piled um, higher to protect it. Due to the absence of aspen uh, seedlings outside of those fences, as well as the impacts that we see on, um, on suckers following fire, uh, we believe that the browse pressure in some areas is probably greater uh, impact than that from climate change at this point. And now we're going to turn it over to Karen. OK, hopefully I can be heard. And let me just go on to the first slide here maybe all right so um, so this was a this is an interesting situation if we're not supposed to have seedlings as a major component or a major factor in aspen regeneration in the west um, but yet we're seeing uh, evidence of seedlings after disturbance and after fire um, so <clears throat> a couple of the one of the big questions really that comes up after that is whether or not these seedling, seedlings might actually persist. And the uh, one way to look at that is to look at the spatial pattern and the distribution of clones. And in order to do that, because I'm a geneticist, of, and I, of course, I'm familiar with these tools, um, this, uh, I can use microsatellites to distinguish clonal boundaries, when in the past, clonal boundaries, as Jim said, are, are really distinguished by um, just visual characteristics and visual traits, maybe leaf shape, leaf color, um, blood burst timing, things like that. But with, with a, a, a set of genetic tools, one of which is called nuclear microsatellites, um, you can actually use these genetic tools to distinguish the uh, clones precisely. So that's what I did. I'm not going to take you through too much about microsatellites. You'll probably be glad to know about that, um, although I'm more than happy to answer questions about it. <clears throat> so instead, I'll just jump straight to the results here. And I'm going to try this arrow thing. Oh, look at that. Ah, oh, there we go. OK. <laughs> so this is a map of some results that came from a, um, a large area. This is about a township, um, which is a, at the top of Logan Canyon in northern Utah. And it, this is a study we did some number of years ago where we sampled uh, 812 aspen stems uh, just on a 50-meter grid. So we just threw down a 50-meter grid right on top of all the aspen stems that were out there to see where the boundaries were. And to our surprise, um, we detected 195 different clones here, which was, which was not at all consistent with what our expectations were. And this begins to suggest that maybe seedlings are not only um, occurring and, and germinating, but that they're also persisting over time. Because if, if you're persisting over over time, then you're going to end up with a greater genetic diversity and genetic diversity that might be a little bit patchy like this. Um, so those, this is consistent with the expectation that maybe seedlings aren't um, something we want to ignore ecologically. <coughs> okay, and so if you look at these um, symbols, some of these symbols are reused from uh, polygon to polygon or stand to stand here, but uh, within each of these um, polygons that you can see here, each stand, the different symbols represent different clones. And we're very, very careful with this not to include, uh, not to count as a separate clone something that was different just by one small, um, uh, one small genetic difference. So this is, we really were pretty conservative in, in identifying these. Another thing I want to point out is that we used one symbol across the whole, <laughs> the whole picture here. Um, these little small white dots, you can see one there, you can see one there, another one there. Those are um, symbols that represent clones that were only seen one time. And so the other message there is that when you sample on a 50 meter grid, most of the clones that we see, we only saw once or twice which, again, is really different from um, what our expectations were. 
So we decided that we needed to look at another area, just in case this was an odd area that we had chosen. And so we did the same sort of sampling strategy down on Fish Lake in central Utah. Um, this is the home of the giant pando clone, which you can actually see here, these uh, dark circles like this. These are paired uh, not because you're losing your vision or you have a migraine right now, but because um, we sampled a, a large tree and a small tree, wondering if the overstory was the same genet as the understory in most cases. So that's what this um, picture is showing. Now, so our results from this study, um, or this plot, suggest that, yeah, we, we do see some big clones in the panda, famous pando clone, which is supposed to be the largest living uh, organism on Earth, is, is uh, certainly one genetic entity. There are other, two other really big <coughs> clones. This is one right here. You can see black triangles. And then there's another one, a uh, great big one down here in a different stand. So there are some big clones. Um, but the surprise to me was not the, so much the presence of a few big clones, but what was happening over here. Again, these little white circles, that doesn't mean that these are all the same clones. That means that these were clones that we only saw once or twice. And so, <laughs> and we call these the onesie twosies. So we had a lot of onesie twosies in here. So over this whole study area then, we detected um, 61 different clones, which was really surprising. And once again, by the majority of clones, we only saw once or twice. Um, so this pattern did seem to hold up, and it has held up since with, uh, with additional study areas. <coughs> OK, so let me go back a couple of slides. One thing I didn't tell you about our symbols here. We found another interesting pattern when we were doing this work. And that is that we began to see three versions of certain um, genetic loci when we only expected to see one or two. And that, without being too technical about it, that suggests that we might be seeing triploids, which are a version um, of, a, of a genotype, a version of a genetic individual that has three copies of its chromosomes instead of the usual two. Okay. <clears throat> so why, what difference, and who would, who would ever care about triploids? <laughs> and I'd like to try to convince you that this might actually be part of the picture, along with the commonality of seedlings. Um, first off, uh, triploids, if they, if they follow other uh, uh, plant species, triploids may be a, a more vegetatively vigorous. So that might be something we care about. Another is that the triploid plants are expected to be sterile, uh, or at least to have greatly reduced fertility. That might be something else we might want to pay attention to. And finally, triploid plants are expected to have bigger cell sizes. And that may well influence their physiology, and in, uh, in particular, their ability to move water. And so these are this is a question uh, that we're looking at right now. Let me go back. To these pictures. Um, in these pictures, in these symbols, the dark symbols, all the, the gray and black symbols here, those are all triploids. Okay? And so you can see a pattern here, <laughs> um, and this is something that has certainly held. The larger clones are, um, tend to be triploids. That doesn't mean that all the triploids are big. There are some small triploids around. But the big ones tend to be triploid clones. And if you look at this slide, remember this is the pando clone. Same symbology here. So the pando clone is also um, apparently one of these one of these triploids. And this is another thing I wanted to point out. We we've, we've also extended this work on triploidy to the entire range of aspen. And um, there are lots of interesting findings here. I don't have time to talk about them all. But um, with respect to triploidy, it does look like triploidy is something you especially find in the West. And this is um, interesting to me because the, the proportions here of triploids versus diploids, those are proportions of genotypes without any regard to the size of the clone. So if we know that triploids <coughs> make up, say, 30 or 40 percent of the genotypes that are the clones that are out there. But at the same time, we know that the larger clones tend to be triploid. 
that suggests that in terms of the numbers of trees out there, there might be a great majority uh, in many of these places that are actually triploid. And that raises, I think, some very interesting kinds of questions. Um, these pictures right here show the actual uh, chromosome squashes. So this is a picture of a triploid aspen clone, and this is a picture of a diploid aspen clone. Here you can see that there's a, this is the continental divide, obviously. This is the same uh, last glacial maximum that Jim talked about in his talk. All right, so a few conclusions then from the genetic data. First off, triploids um, are apparently common, uh, maybe quite common in many of these western landscapes. Um, most of the very large clones that we see are triploid, but most of the clones are small, some of them very small, and the patterns suggest that seeding events um, are likely much more common than we once believed. And now I will turn it back over to Jim. Well, another uh, another thing that that um, has, uh, with respect to Western aspen, that has uh, at least changed for me. Uh, and again, I'm I'm going to uh, I'm going to somewhat over simplify the, the the conventional wisdom, but uh, for the sake of the the story. But uh, there, there clearly uh, are multiple pathways of stand development for aspen. Now that's been recognized. I mean, you you. Folks have referred to stable aspen, a stable aspen type versus a serial aspen type, and so on. But uh, the, the story's richer than that. Um, we um, and and for me, I mean, speaking for myself, part of it has been really ignoring what what was right before my eyes because it didn't fit the model. Uh, high severity disturbance, essentially a pure stand, single species, single cohort. Uh, when in fact, uh, on, on you know any certainly any landscape in the Rockies, there are, there are examples of that, lots of examples of that. But there are also lots of examples of aspen uh, apparently being pretty happy in mixed species, mixed aged stands, even including 300 year old uh, old growth in uh, Engelmann spruce, subalpine fir, and aspen. Uh, which is uh, some of the stems being as old as any anything in the stand. Uh, the kind of the 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 bottom line for for me for, as a silviculturist is that uh, the argument that that we need to broaden our view of of aspen. Um, I you know that it would include the uh, multiple pathways of stand development. Um, Broader, a broader view of of aspen respira restoration than we've uh, than we perhaps have had, uh, and also I, I think that a lot of this uh, a lot of this new information uh, really suggests uh, a, a, a revisiting uh, our views of appropriate reference models for restoration. Now, all of this is made timely. Now, certainly, silviculturists and others have are are concerned about aspen, and in my part of the world, the central central Rockies, the the idea of conifer encroachment, the the perhaps the loss of of clones due to successional displacement uh, on particularly on marginal sites, the decline, rapid decline of of some stands and and clones um, with uh, Loss of the overstory without without regeneration. Those are all concerns that that uh, lots of us lots of us deal with. Um, one of the things I, I talked about simple coppice being the being the traditional model. Well, it, it it's clear to me at least that um, there are lots of potentially situationally appropriate alternative silvicultural systems that. Uh, that ought that silviculturists at least ought to consider uh, everything from from group selection um, to uh, to to different kinds of reserve systems. But certainly, aspen uh, can can be a, a major player in many forest types uh, as 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 part of a mixed species and even mixed age mixed age stand. Our, our understanding of, of aspen genetics and regeneration ecology is, is dynamic. It's changing. 
uh, the last uh, five years or so have have you know there's just a lot of really solid contributions to the literature to support this. Um, this this particular uh, this particular image is a is an interesting one. It's here in northern Utah uh, on the uh, Deseret Land and Livestock Ranch that some of you may be familiar with, but a number of stands and and multiple clones. And uh, this area was subjected to a to a late spring uh, freeze, and a, that that was pretty widespread. It occurred uh, over a very large area and affected everything from Gamble Oak to to Aspen. Uh, interestingly, the the and all of these trees relieved, but uh, the ones that were particularly hard hit were the were the uh, clones that that leafed out early. One of the things that that is certainly uh, going to is going to change uh, in the in the coming years is is the idea of of genetic transfer. I mean, for for a long, long time, foresters have have been concerned about seed zones and uh, seed transfer guidelines, that sort of thing, and moving in moving uh, genetic material around. Um, you know, we're we're paranoid about introducing off-site material that, uh, that that may not be adapted and so on. Uh, and, and that concern and that history is reflected for for lots of species with, with a great deal of information about how, how to, to appropriately move material around. Uh, Aspen's been ignored in that, and I, I think uh, that that's, that's, that must change. Uh, the idea when we start to think about assisted migration, which which people are already thinking about, that's that's clearly going to it's going to be necessary to to get a better handle on on uh, adaptations and how how material can can be moved. So to kind of kind of summarize, um, I, I think I I started this with with my my version of of some conventional wisdom, but um, you know. It, Clearly, seeding events are, are, are appear to be actually fairly common. Uh, there's there's real time evidence of that, uh, that that Mary Lou talked about, uh, and there's also the the signature of seeding events in in the genetic work that that Karen referred to. Uh, within within stand, genetic diversity is is clearly much greater than uh, we we thought uh, not too long ago, and it's it's almost certainly ecologically and silviculturally relevant. Um, the ecological roles that, and I'm referring to stand dynamics and succession, uh, in fact are varied. Aspen, Aspen's a remarkable species with, with a huge ecological amplitude and it's, uh, uh, it's probably in, in hindsight it was, it was pretty silly that some of us had such a narrow view of what it could do. Um, the, uh, its, its ecological roles are, are not restricted uh, to the to the conventional model, and then finally, uh, in, in I would argue that there's a broad range of silvicultural alternatives which can and, and in some cases I, I think should uh, should be considered that go way, well beyond uh, the traditional simple coppice. Thank you very much, and um, I think we turn it over to to Rose to to moderate. Questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Jim, Karen, and Mary Lou. This is Rose Long again. We have plenty of time for questions, so uh, keep them coming in the chat pod. We have a couple that people have presented over the course of the presentation, and we'll start with this question for Jim. Uh, this is Barry Johnston. He says, "I believe that the conventional wisdom." Clear, uh, specified clear felling as the treatment of choice largely because of hormonal control over sprouting. Has this perspective changed? If so, what are the known controls over aspen sprouting? Uh, well, uh, my, from my perspective, uh, no. I, I think Barry's, uh, you know, his, his statement is, is correct. And uh, I think that what, again, from my perspective, what, what has changed is that uh, the the that clear felling and that hormonal I mean you you had to decapitate all of the stems in order to get successful regeneration over fairly large areas 
and I think that that's that that has that has changed. That that there are it's it's able to regenerate vegetatively and from seedlings uh, with much less heavy-handed disturbance. So that would that would be the change uh, I think from my perspective. Not not the physiology of of uh, vegetative reproduction. Good answer, Jim. This is Rose again. Uh, here's a question for Karen. This is from a guest. Uh, the guest says, one of the ideas we're considering regarding climate change is treating high elevation mixed aspen to stimulate suckering so there's more seed production in the future to colonize areas that become newly suitable as the climate changes. Do we need to consider whether these stands are diploid or triploid? Are there any field characteristics that can give a clue? Wow, that's a great question. I wish we had two-way video so we could gesticulate a lot. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's a really neat question. Um, if you're looking at seed sources, then yeah, triploidy is something you really want to be cautious about because it we, we really have not known to ask questions about triploid until now. And the result of that is that we don't know very much about it. We don't know um, just exactly how fertile they are. We don't know how frequently they produce flowers. I know Pando produces the big male clone that produces flowers. Um, we don't know if there is anything like pollen swamping. You know, there's just a whole range of things. So um, if I'm understanding your question, yeah, we do need to be, uh, if you're looking at seed sources, you definitely need to be looking um, to see if, if, your, if your sources are tripled because you're not going to have very much viability. Um, I, I don't know if that answers the question. Field test. Field test. We need a field test, Jim says. No, that, I think that was part of the question. Is there, is there a way to, that, that you could, uh, when you walk into a stand, can you, oh, right. can you identify sort of without <laughs> genetic magic? <laughs> no, you need genetic magic. Um, <laughs> we have, uh, I've been fiddling with that uh, out in the field because we do have a lot of clones <laughs> that have, or the trees that have been tagged and they have known uh, ploidy differences. And to tell you the truth, I'm seeing a whole range of phenotypes and um, I, I'm not seeing anything that's really jumping out as a strong, strong indicator other than just flat out clonal size. And we have another question here uh, about diploids and triploids for you, Karen. This is from Wayne Shepard. He asks, <laughs> do diploid aspen sucker as well as triploid genotypes? Hi, Wayne. Thanks. That was a good question, too. Um, there, that's a difficult question to look at because uh, aspen clones are so extremely variable with the variance with, uh, among clones may completely swamp out the variance among triploids and diploids, if that makes sense. So that's kind of a hard thing to, to look at. However, I'll say that um, we have a, a collaboration going in uh, Rick Lindroth's lab. I'm not sure if Rick is here today, but um, we are beginning to look at physiological differences between diploids and triploids, mostly associated with, with uh, the economy of water. Uh, but it, we, we are certainly tracking the number of uh, suckers and that there may be something there. I think that would be an interesting question to ask, but a really difficult one um, because of the background variance in clones, in root health, um, things like that. So uh, I'd love to know that. And we have a question here that maybe Mary Lou can answer. This is a question from Barry Johnston. He asks, how do single species aspen stands naturally reproduce? And what about serial stands that have multiple aspen generations? Um, yeah, I'm not sure that, um, that we have the answer to that. Oh, um, one thing I was going to add to the conversation uh, was that we found that um, just 60% of our uh, seedlings were sprouting. So certainly um, it, it's going to uh, affect some of the work that Karen has been doing in the more mature stands that 
whether or not um, they seeded in earlier or not is, is going to depend on how well uh, you won't be able to tell just from testing because you don't know how well they uh, vegetatively reproduce. Um, but certainly the, the large triploids are showing that they are vegetatively reproducing. Um, in our early work with our young seedlings, the triploids aren't standing out right now as far as their vegetative reproduction. Thanks a lot for that. Do you have a comment on that, Karen or Jim? Um, there's, we could add a little bit here. I, I think it's, it's interesting uh, what, what Mary Lou is saying about the, 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 the low number of triploids that we know about in that study. Uh, I have a graduate student, Richie Gardner, who has also done a little bit of work looking at the uh, in, in trees that are oh, five inch DBH or so, looking at the last, mm, I believe it was 10 years of growth. And uh, we were not able to find a difference between diploids and triploids uh, with respect, respect to increment. Uh, at the, in, in those years. But I do wonder if there might be some differences early on that in, they, they could be physiologically based, they, they could be hormonally based, I don't know. But I think um, looking at the early stand development in, in these triploids and diploids might be a, a really interesting uh, question. All right, we have a question here from uh, Rob Taylor. He asks, would fire be contraindicated if, if a stand was a single triploid? Uh, Jim, Jim is shaking his head, and I agree with that. In fact, it, it might kind of be the opposite. Um, if, if triploids are, um, the way to maintain a triploid in a, in a landscape would be through um, coppicing or through fire or disturbances like that that set it back and stimulate suckering. So, but that kind of management would certainly, I would think, would favor um, triploids, especially if the triploids are the big ones. And um, so you, you might have, uh, you, might, you might tend to favor triploidy by that kind of disturbance that, that, uh, that causes lots of suckering, but at the same time you're, you're potentially losing genetic diversity at the larger scale over time because you're going to be favoring the large suckers and the clones that can persist by suckering. That may be the triploids, and we might be losing genetic diversity, especially if we're not allowing some of these or uh, recognizing and conserving some of these seeding events. Um, here's an observation from Dave Tart and a question on the end of it. He says polyploidy is related to drought tolerance in shrubs. Could that be why triploidy is more prominent at the south end of Populus tremuloides range? Um, that, that's pretty, I mean, speculative, but it, it certainly um, it certainly makes sense to me. I mean, I uh, I think that when when uh, I first became aware of Karen's and, and her collaborators' work with with the triploids and the the fact that it's it's much more common uh, in the in the Rockies than it is in the boreal, for example, it, it it seems like that that's that's one obvious that's one obvious correlate. Um, so I think it's a, I think it's a good hypothesis. Um, I'll add one thing to that, and that has to do with cell size. Um, if you look at uh, what we expect in triploids and diploids is that triploids are going to have larger cell sizes. Uh, what we're looking at right now, again, in, cl in collaboration with Rick Lindroth's lab, um, is that we that there may, uh, if that translates into xylem element size, then that could have a lot to do with how these triploids move water. So triploids may be better than diploids in certain um, climates, and maybe, those, maybe in past climates. But as we start seeing new levels of drought, and maybe drought in new areas, things like that, uh, it may be that triploids actually have a disadvantage because they may well cavitate more easily. And so that's a, a kind of question that I'm very intrigued by, and we're trying to uh, set up uh, common garden studies and even in, in field studies to begin to look at uh, hydraulics and triploid versus diploid aspen. Again, we're going to run, <laughs> we're certainly going to run into the problem where there is so much clonal variance 
in uh, water moving characteristics, water moving traits that um, that may swamp out differences between diploids and triploids, meaning that it may require a ginormous sample size. So that's yet to be determined. We have another question here. This is from Randy Fuller. So if you're going to start an assisted migration program, would you look to diploid or triploid? <laughs> wow. Randy, that's, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, I'll offer one thought. Um, and the, I, I have this fantasy that, that triploid clones, that there are going to be some superstars in terms of, of fiber production. Uh, and so, if if I had a uh, uh, you know some kind of a fiber focus, that maybe I would be using triploids. Uh, that's somewhat speculative, but that's a possibility. On the other hand, uh, if your if your your goal is is to conserve uh, genetic diversity. Um, I'm thinking that the focus would be the focus would be on diploids because they're they're going to I mean you you've got the opportunity for further uh, genetic diversity arising in the future. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, and and some of the answer to that question may come from. Uh, how easily triploids are to propagate versus diploids. Uh, dip, it, one of the things I did not mention is that in a in a particular seed crop of aspen um, that comes, you know, from diploids, presumably, it, that your initial um, proportion of diplo of triploids is going to be very very low. That's what we expect. So if we're seeing a high proportion of triploidy over time. That's very likely to be the result of site selection, of natural selection happening. And so, <laughs> um, if you are able to maintain genetic diversity and do seedling plantings to maintain aspen, at some point you will be regenerating and potentially selecting for triploids. So, it probably depends upon your management goals and the time scale over which you're interested. We have a couple of questions about how to distinguish sprouts from seed, and also how to distinguish diploids from triploids. Um, this question is from Diane. She asks, well, she says, when we survey disturbances, we don't collect data in a way to distinguish sprouts from seedlings. Is this something we need to do in the future? Yeah, I think, I think Diane, so, you, you probably are really looking for uh, or for, for more work, uh, I, I mean, my, I'm shooting from the hip here, but I'm thinking that, that no, that isn't something that would be realistically and routinely included in, in your regeneration monitoring. Rather, I think with just an appreciation, an increased appreciation that, that seedlings might be present as opposed to just suckers, that uh, in events where Especially in situations where, um, you, you know, because of distance from the, the, the rarity of aspen in the, in the, the pre-disturbance stand, that kind of thing, where you would expect possibly more seedlings, that maybe an increased effort to protect those might be warranted, uh, again, along the lines of, of conserving genetic diversity. So if you had a limited fencing budget, I mean, that might might be one of your decision points about where you're going to spend money for fencing, that, that kind of thing. And I was just going to add that uh, part, part of the reason. Part of the reason for um, doing this um, webinar was to get the word out that it is happening so that there is an awareness and if you should happen to to find them in an area especially where you're worried um, about impacts from browsers um, as far as some of the areas we have uh, where we've had a pressure for a um, hundred years plus of heavy ungulate pressure and that um, and on top of that that um, there's a selection pressure going on for drought resistant 
um, stems out there that uh, you know you, the awareness and if you do happen to see them that they can be protected. So not so much uh, looking for them as doing something when you find them, I guess. <laughs> Here's a question from Keith Gustafson. He says, my understanding is that to distinguish clones that are diploid or triploid can only occur in a lab using microscopes. Is it realistic to consider this characteristic when planning treatments to regenerate or maintain aspen? Yeah, I can take that one. That's a, another really good question. Um, it turns out that there are a couple of additional ways to identify triploids versus diploids. They're not as reliable as looking at chromosome squashes in the microscope, but that is incredibly labor intensive because you have to grow uh, aspen up in the greenhouse, you have to get the soil just right, you have to pick off just the right root tip, and then you have to make a bunch of squashes until just the right one appears. Um, those, those slides that I showed of the, of the microscope uh, squashes of a diploid and triploid are the product of about a year or more of uh, work. So that I would agree that looking at a microscope and counting chromosomes is not very practical. However, if you use uh, microsatellites and begin to see three alleles per locus, that's a fairly uh, quick and easy test. And that, that uh, certainly could give you a, a, a very strong indication that it's a triploid. In addition, there's a, a technique that we use most of the time called uh, flow cytometry. And it's a, it's a quick way to look at differences in nuclear density. Uh, it also is not as clean and not as, as certain as the microscope test. Uh, but it's a really, really good indicator. And we've been able to pick out diploids and, and triploids fairly reliably using one or especially both of those. Here's another question. This is from PC Arborist. I hope I'm interpreting this question incorrectly. What would the percentages of diploid and triploid aspen be in response to climate change? <laughs> that's, a, that's another good question. I wish I knew that. <laughs> I'm looking around here for somebody to ask. <laughs> but, uh, I, I, uh, I think it depends on the relative differences that we find between diploids and triploids. We don't know if there are certain things that are universally true about triploids versus diploids that might give them an advantage or potentially a disadvantage um, with uh, projected uh, future climates. And so that's the kind of research that we're looking into right now. And it, there are a whole bunch of real exciting questions. Um, and I know that's not a very satisfying answer, but, <laughs> but uh, it is an area of active research right now. Uh, one, one thing that occurs, it occurs to me that I did not mention, I probably should have, um, I have an undergrad, a pair of undergrad students right now that are looking at a, a, a test that may help us distinguish diploids and triploids, and that's the size uh, of the stomatal opening. In the, in the back of the leaf. You could actually, potentially, you could measure that using a field microscope. And it, if it's reliably different between diploids and triploids, that could be a nice uh, field assay. We don't know the results of that yet, but we have a lot of leaves that we have um, taken microscopic images of, and we're analyzing that right now. <laughs> 